Chapter Seven: The Meeting of the Wimpolers. The last, the last thing on our list is to make a bird bath, and with all the water in the Meadow Lock River, I'm not sure why we need more. But for some reason, Billy thinks the birds need even a few. Oh, sorry. The birds need even more. And then, believe it or not, Billy tells me he's come up with a new list of things we need to do. But I haven't seen it because he has it stored in his head. Plus, I'm not sure I want to know what's on it because it's probably going to mean more work. Billy checks his watch. This is a perfect time of break for a break. Want to come to my house for lunch? I. Already asked my mom if we could, and she said yes. So that's what I say too. When we walked into Billy's house, I can't believe my eyes. There are kids all over the place, and each one looks like they're having a blast. They're jumping on the couch, climbing on the ch- chairs, crawling under the rug, and sliding down the stairs. And one's standing right in the middle of the kitchen table, which is Susan. Forest, his mother says, smiling with a while she scoops him up. Get off the table. Even though you're little, you know the rules. Now, right away, I know she's not like Graham because Graham would let Petals climb up on the table every morning and eat breakfast with us. I give her a bowl of frosted wet. With flakes, since that's what she liked best. But Graham would feed her plain old grits, oatmeal, or a piece of cornbread. She said all those sugared flakes made petals flit around the house, house like a chicken with her head cut off. And I know petals didn't appreciate that comment on one bite. One bit. Billy introduced me to his mother and all the kids, but there's no way I'll remember their names since there's six of them. And I'm not sure what to call Billy's mom because he actually forgot that part. But I figured if his dad is Pastor Henry, she must be Mrs. Henry. Pastor Henry gathers all the kids using his hand like a broom to sweep up a bunch of wild dust bunnies. Then he picks up for a rat. Up for us, and sets him in a high chair while Mrs. Henry pulls out a chair for me. Thanks, Mrs. Henry. I say, trying to be sure I use every bit of manners I know. Mrs. Henry is real pretty, and when she smiles, her blue eyes sparkle. Most people call me Mrs. Whipple. We for real, she says. Since that's our last name, Billy's dad is called Pastor Henry because Henry is his. First name, and it's easier for people to call him Pastor Henry when pa- than Pastor Wilfredo. She smiles at me again and says, "I know that confusing river." Mrs. Wilfredo tries real hard, so I don't feel as dumb as I do. While Mrs. Wilfredo passes out the place and. And silverware. I start worrying that Bill is going to say something about the morning and evening dolphs, dolph things. If he does, I might have to slide under the table and vanish. In the center of the table, Mrs. Winfrey sets a gigantic pot that's overflowing with macaroni and cheese with little pieces of hot dog. She plops a surprise. So a super sized scoop of it in the middle of everyone's plate, which must be the easiest way to serve food when there's a gazette gazette little mouth to fit. I don't particularly like my food all mixed together like that, but I keep my mouth shut and resist the r- urge to separate my noodles from the bits of the hot dog. Right before I start the day again, I suddenly realize everyone's holding everyone else's hands and putting their heads down, not all the way down to on the table like you do at school when you're in trouble, but just part way down, like 
They're looking for a piece of hot dog they drop on their lap. Then Pastor Henley says, Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks for our food and for all our blessings. Thank you for Billy's new friend, River. Help us live our lives pleasing to you. Amen. Then everybody else, including Little Forest, shouts, Amen. By now, I figure I'm officially known by everyone in Birdsong as Billy's new friend, and added to ju- that just a second ago as the girl who don't doesn't know people in Birdsong hold hands and pray before they eat. After lunch, me and Billy go back across the street to the bird's boarding place. He carries the garbage can wi- lid wheel. We'll use to make the bird best. So he says, "What do you think of my last name?" I, it sure is different. I've never heard the la- name Weeperell before. Billy stops on the trail, and his eyes grow bigger than fifty cent piece. You never heard of a Weeperell? I shake my head and start feeling dumb all over again. That's okay, he says, and starts walking. It's just a name, like the whip for wheel bird. They bled in the in with tree bark and dead leaves on the ground, so they can be real hard to see. But even though you can always see them, you'll know they're there. Okay, Mister Know It All, I tease. How do you know they're there if you can't see them? Because you hear them, especially on summer evenings. They sound like they're saying "whip for real, whip for real, whip for real." Wow, that's kind of neat. I'm beginning to think Billy may be right. Birds are more interesting than I thought. We reach the bird place, and Billy sets the lid beside the pole with the wooden bird feeder. I'm glad we had a plastic lid. Metal would get too hot in the sun, he says. Now all we have to do is build a base to keep the birds be just high enough of the ground to keep the stray cats or a fox from catching the birds. The base will be easy to make. We can use rocks again, and we should put a couple inside the lid so it doesn't blow away. You know, Billy, do you think the birds even need a bird bird bath? There's a son of water right here in the river. Besides, I don't, I didn't think this was going to be such so much work, and I definitely don't want to look for rocks again. Billy spreads the dirt flat where we'll put the bird bath. First of all, he says yes. The birds need a bird bath, even though some of the bigger birds, like ducks and blue herons, love the river. It's too big and dangerous for some of the smaller big birds that like to drink. And bathe in a small, safe place. And second, he adds, this, getting an A is hard work. But don't worry about the rocks. I'll find them. The end of chapter seven. Chapter eight. Another list. We've been working since seven o'clock this morning, with only a half hour lunch break. So I've been hoping Billy would forget about the new list of things he wants to do, but. Of course he doesn't. Bookworms are like elephants; they never forget. He tells me what's on his list, like he's reading from an encyclopedia. First, we need to scatter a small piece of yarn and close throughout our echo town. Birds will use them to make nets. Second, we'll make sure. You better get an a plus, not just an A. The river bank is the meadow lark. Lark River rushes fast, so it could be dangerous to get water from there. I look at Billy and say, "We are carrying water all the way from your house." 
We could, he says, but I'm sure there's a way to get it from the river. It would be a lot less work, that's for sure. Since I like to work as little as possible, my brain starts spinning ideas faster than a gerbil spins an exercise wheel. What if we tied a long rope to a bucket and drop it over the edge? On the riverbank, we could pull up the bucket, like pulling up a bucket of, of from of water from a well. Billy smiles. He's probably thinking I'm pretty smart too. Great idea, he says. Let's run back to my garage, ju- garage, and get everything we'll need. Making into Billy's gar- garage is like walking into an inventor's museum. It's filled with all sorts of old interesting metal and wooden things. There are piles of wood, cans of paint stacked on shelves, hammers and screwdrivers hanging on the wall, and rows of glass baby rolls of glass baby food jars filled with nails. Billy reaches for a hammer and says, This is my dad's workshop. We build things together all the time. I can't even imagine how awesome that would be. You're so lucky, Billy. I run my hands across his wooden workbench. When my parents find me, I'm going to build things with my dad too. All of a sudden, Billy stops rummaging around. What do you mean? When your parents find you, I thought you said you were adopted. Don't you have parents? I have two, I say, two sets. So I surely have four parents. I just don't live with me. I live with Graham. She's my grandmother. Billy looks at me like I'm not making sense, so I explain. I have my real parents, and then I have my adoptive parents. That makes four. I understand why you don't live with your real parents, but why don't you live with your adopted parents? Well, it's a sort of a mixed up story, I say, but I decided to tell him anyway. From For some reason, after my adopted parents had me for six months, they de- decided they didn't want me anymore. That's when they took off and left me behind. They never came back. Now I live with Graham. So which parents do you want to find you? My real ones, of course. I figured they never wanted to give me up in the first place. I'm sure they must have had a good reason, but I guess it would be all right if my adoptive parents come back because they probably have information about my real ones. Did you ever try finding your real parents? No, I say and look at him. I told you I didn't come with much information. All I know is my first name and the birthday that was on my necklace, which isn't much information to go on. And Graham doesn't know anything either, but I'm not worried about that because I'm sure my real parents have been looking for me. So by this time, they should be getting close. They could show up here any time now. Well, after we finish our project, I'll help you with some research. Maybe, I tell him. Billy looks surprised. What do you mean maybe? Don't you think that would be a good idea? Bird sounds an extremely small town, so I doubt they'll look for you here. Billy searches my eyes. River, maybe you should start looking for them. I told you I don't have to worry about that. Graham says the postmaster their knows our new address, so when they got to Pangsu 20, they'll know where to come. Billy looks at me the same way Graham does when I talk about my parents finding me. Like he doesn't believe it will happen either. Billy shrugs his shoulder and then pulls a rust red wagon out from the corner of the garage. 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 He brushes it off. Anyways, he says, let's use this a uh, haul or supplies. Then he finds a rope, an old metal bucket, two green sparking cans, and a small square wire thing hanging from a hook. It looks a bit like an animal cage, but it's, it'd be too small. 
even for a gerbil. Bailey smiles and holds it up like it's a trophy. What in the world is that? This is a shot cage. He says a special type of bird fiddle. Now when we must when we make shoot case we'll have a way to hang them. Woodpeckers, chick ch chick and nuts nuts love shoot. And he adds he adds, so does my favorite bird, which is what which is what kind? I figure I might as well ask because he's going to tell me anyway. The bluebird, he says as he smells. They're incredible. And not just because of their bl brilliant blue feathers and how beautifully they sing, but because their matting with tools are fascinating. Imagine this, when two bird bluebirds are courting, which is kind of like that thing, the male bluebird raises our and quivers one wing while he feeds his mate little morsels of food. Hmm, I said, that is fascinating. But even so, I'm not sure that's my idea of romance. But one thing for sure, if Billy were a bird, he'd probably have one, only one, one wing that worked, so he'd do just fine as a bluebird. The only problem is that even though he could court, he wouldn't be able to fly, and that could be a real turn off of a girl bird. As we are leaving the gar garage, something else catches Billy's eye. He reaches up and grabs us off the shelf. Awesome, he says. I knew we had one some here, somewhere. What is it? After shoot cages. And shit cakes. I'm not even going to guess. It's a hummingbird feeder. Now we can make hummingbird nectar too. I don't know any other guy who knows how to make shit cakes and hummingbird nectar and gets excited about it. Grandma say he is a rare bird and like a T bone steak. steak. Sometimes rare is good. The end of chapter 8. Chapter 9 The Bucket After the wagons loaded with our supplies, we raced each other to Billy's kitchen. Mrs. Wilforil was standing at the sink, peeling a tractor load of vegetables. Forrest and two other little Wilford wheels are racing around the kitchen with wooden cars, and the bigger ones are washing vegetables. Hey, Mom, Billy says. Do you have some yarn or clothes we can use for our project? Mrs. Wiforel talks us that of hair behind her ear. I'm sure I can find some of each, Billy. What do you need it for? We can we want to scatter pieces of it around our echo tone so the birds can make nests with it. That's a great that's a great idea, she says. I have some blue and yellow yarn left from knitting forest baby blanket and also scraps of green material from the curtains I made. That should make some colorful nest. And how about these vegetable peelings? She says. Do you Do you think the birds would eat them? Please shake the her Sorry, Billy shakes his head. They only draw predators, and probably the kind that we that would eat birds. I look at Billy. You mean predators like rattlesnakes? Billy swings around to face me, and his eye near eyes nearby pop out of his head. He mouths the words. What are you doing? Then he answers out loud so his mom can hear. Well, sure, vegetable peelings could attack snakes, so we better not take any. But the yarn and metal, ma yarn and material would be great. Billy seems pretty excited about the nest material, but I'm not sure the birds will use it. Then I measure Billy as a bluebird and think about how he'd build his nest. He definitely used the blue yarn. He'd have to make sure his nest perfectly matched his brilliant blue feathers. 
Then Billy moves closer to his mom, leans to the sink, and looks at her with puppy dog eyes. And is it okay if we make hummingbird nectar and shoot cakes too? Mrs. Winford smiles. Sure, Billy. Just make me a list. There's paper and a pencil near the phone. Billy hands them to me and tells me what to write. I'll bet his mom can't hear, can't read chicken scratch either. He says, "We only need sugar, shoot, or oatmeal, yellow corn meal, for flour, and crunchy peanut butter." Then he puts the list by his mom's purse. We head back to the burning place. As Billy pulls the wagon, one of the rusty wheels cries out, Squeak, squeak, squeak. Billy laughs. That sounds like a bird that's having a real rotten day. Like maybe he was frightening with his brothers, fighting, fighting with his brothers and sisters, and they push him out of the nest. Now he's got me laughing. Or maybe he sounds like that because he stuffed too many worms in his mouth. Or maybe that's what a bird sounds like when they're learning to talk. Mama, Dada. Whatever, I say, and kick off a stone off the rail. Sorry, River, I didn't mean to make you think about your parents. That's okay, I'm not, it's not your fault. I think about them all the time anyways. When we reach our Agaton, he be threw pieces of blue and yellow yarn and scraps of green material all over the place, tossing them into the wind of conf confetti. Some land on the branches of shrubs and trees, some near the edge of the woods, and some fall on the ground nearby bird feeders and bird pests. Who knows? Maybe every bird in bird song will come and build a beautiful nest. I hope they do because Billy would really like that, and I think I would too. Since we are ready for the water, I get the rope and tie it to the bucket. I used a bowline knot that Graham, Graham taught me. I remember him guiding my hands over the rope, saying, The rabbit hoops out of the hole, goes around the tree, and back down the hole. It still works like magic. Time to try it out, I tell Billy, but I'm going first. I'm not trying to be bossy, bossy. I just think it's too dangerous for Billy, and it's scary enough standing at the edge of the river with two good arms. So it could be twice as scary as only one. I stand at the edge, edge, dig my toes into the ground and throw the bucket as hard as and as far out, out into the river as I can. Then I watch it drop. It lands close to where I want it and sinks deep into the water. I pull it up, one hand over the other, all along the length of the rope. When it reaches the top, I bend down, steady myself with one, with one hand and grab the bucket with my other. But since it bumped against the cliff, on the way up is barely helpful. Maybe we should get the water from your house, I say. This is trickier than I thought. Billy shakes his head. The river's natural resource. It's not chlorinated like tap water. The birds and flowers will serve if they have it. He says, we need the river water. Well, the bucket idea isn't going to go working that great. Besides, don't you think it's dangerous? Not if we're careful. Okay, I tell him, but I get the water and you do the wat watering. Billy glares at me. You're afraid I can't do it, are you? No, I say, feeling a little girly for life. It's just that, I know, he says, it's just that I only have one arm that works, right? He reaches for the bucket. Give it here, River. I want to tie a rope on his belt, Lou, in case he falls, but mostly I want to tell him not to do it. He tugs the free end of the rope under his right foot and shivers his way to secure it. 
Then he grabs the bucket in his left hand and throws it. But the wind has picked up and blow against us, so the bucket bangs against the cliffs and gets caught on the root. He yanks it free and tries again. This time it goes a little farther and lands at the base of the cliff where the blotters are. Billy looks at me. I'm not giving up, he says. I can do this. He throws us again, and after reaching the water, it sinks fast. He pulls the rope and throws it closer. After each pull, he, re he secures the rope under his foot. He does it over and over until it reaches the top. Then he kneels on his left knee, grabs the bucket, and brings it over to the edge. See? I look inside. It's more than helpful. Wow, you did it. He carries the bucket to the bird base and sprinkling cans and fill them, fills them. Then, when we are wa watching our sis, Pastor Henry comes back to check our progress. You choose and uh, you choose you chose an excellent idea for your project. He says, "I think it's wonderful to make something for our community, community, and I'm sure Mrs. Kingfisher would have been pleased." All of a sudden, Pastor Henry looks at the rope and the bucket. Is that how you're getting water? Billy nods. I don't say a word. The riverbank is too steep, Billy. I'd rather you use the wagon and transport water from the house. Understand? Billy looks like he's about to say something, probably about the river being a nature resource. But the old, an older couple strolls over to us before he says a word. Hello, Pastor Henry and Billy, the older man says, and his wife smells like she said that too. He reaches out and shakes my hand. I'm Mr. Bunting, Bunting, and this is my lovely wife. My name is River. I'm Billy's new friend. Billy tells them every detail about our project. What splendid news, says Mr. Bunting. A perfect way to honor, honor the Kingfishers. Mrs. Bunting nods her head. For fact, indeed. You know, I have plenty of pink and purple carolina flocks in my garden that's already blooming. I'll dig up a patch to share. You'll be happy to know the hummingbirds and butterflies absolutely adore it. Then Mr. and Mrs. Bunting says the same thing. See you at church tomorrow. With that, they, lay, they head down the river pass holding hands. Pastor Henry turns to leg me. Speaking to, of church, would you like to join us tomorrow morning? Service starts at 11 o'clock, but anyone comes a bit early to visit. I'm not actually sure what to say. Um, Gran and I don't go to church, but she used to. We do chores on Sundays, and she just spent a lot of money on gas moving here, so she doesn't play on driving for a while. Pastor Henry keeps looking at me. He probably thinks I'm making up excuses, but I'm not. Understand, he says, but we keep our service short because we believe in spending time with family on Sundays too. And we'd be happy to give you and your grandmother a ride. We could pick you up just before 10.30. Pastor Henry puts his strong hand on my shoulder and says, I'd be happy if you pass the invitation on to your grandmother. I tell him I will, even though there's no chance we'll be going. The end of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Graham accepts Graham's bag of tools seems heavier as I carry it back home, and the wall the walk feels longer too. When I finally get there, it's supper time, and Graham's pulling a steamy tuna little casserole out of the oven. She wears her old apron with purple violets all over it. So even though it's not our kitchen bag in Punks 20, it almost feels like it is. My goodness, sugar pie, you've been at the river the whole living live long day. Must be some project you're working on. Grandma sets the casserole on the table with a clock. I thought I'd be eating alone. Now wash those hands and sit down to have a bite with your old gram. Then she plops a giant scoop of tuna noodle right in the middle of my plate. Maybe Mrs. Riffle is a little like Graham, after all. 
a telegram all about our birding place, about the kingfishers, Bill, fi, kingfishers, really seed packages, our ecotone and shoot cakes and hummingbird nectar and gazillion little referrals, Pastor Henry's workshop, Mrs. Martin and her licking dog, Mrs. Bunting's car. Caronia flocks and about Robert, the kid with long grassy hair who tried to intimidate Billy. Well, that's a all wonderful sugar pie, but I don't sing. I don't like the sounds of the of the Robert. I gotta think a kid who tries picking on a nice boy like Billy doesn't have both oars in the water. Grandpa's a hipping. Spoon, spoonful in her mouth and swallows. Well, I can hardly wait to see that burning place. How about we walk there af after chores tomorrow? It's about a quarter mile, Graham, so it's far, it's too far with your leg. We'd better drive. We're walking. Sugar pie, then she gives me a wink. My future surface says walking will make, will, will make Making me it stronger. I slow, I slow, I so. Oh, sorry. I swallow my tuna noodle in one big glove, and I almost drop my milk. What? You went already? I wasn't gonna start till we were all settled in, but this morning I heard the wind. It told me to take a drive through town, and wouldn't you know, I end up seeing a sign that said, "Person Fisher." Physical therapy welcomes you. So I parked Tilly on the side of the road and went for it. Come to find out, someone had just cancelled an appointment, so I grabbed it faster than a dog will lick a dish. And let me tell you, that therapist knows what he's talking about. He's no nickel. Nincom poop, that's for sure. He showed me all sorts of ex exercise that will make my legs strong. So tomorrow, sugar pie will walk into that burning place. I smell a gram. I can't wait to share you. Then I remember Pastor Henry's invitation, even though she'll say no. Billy's dad invited us to the church tomorrow. He's the pastor, so everyone calls him Pastor Henry. He said he gave us a ride. Well, that's a nice invitation, Sugar Pie. You tell him we'll go. I can't think of any other explanation for Graham saying yes, so I start worrying about aliens again. After dinner, I clear the table and Graham washes, just like we did in Punk 20. Then, before I know it, Graham looks like she's in ba ballet class and starts to relief right in front of our kitchen sink while she's washing a tuna noodle casserole dish. She raises up high on her toes, then goes down flat and up high again, then down, and all the while she's smelling like a delighted ballerina. That's, there's just one problem, she's not. I'm pretty sure her physical Sarah's pit must have something to do with it. I just hope she doesn't start wearing a tutu. The end of chapter 10. Chapter 11. The Warring Thing. At exactly 10.25 Sunday morning, the before reels big white van, which is the size of a bus, pulls in our driveway. Graham and I hurry out the door. Well, I hurry and Grandma waddles. Pastor Henry rolls down his window to greet us, so I introduce Graham. Graham, this is a pa this is Pastor Henry. Pastor Henry, this is my grandmother, Mrs. Notch, Not Hedge. And to her surprise, I do it so eloquently that she phrase speechless, and Graham is never speechless. Then she shakes her head and whispers, Well, and we. Next thing I know, Billy jumps out, opens the van door for us, and pulls it shut once we're in the hole while his right arm is swinging back and forth like a pendulum. I forgot to tell Mom, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell Graham about his arm. I I wonder if she noticed. As Graham and I splash, squash it 
squash together in the second rows, row of seats, were instantly surrounded by a flock of little referrals. Every one of them wants to sit on Graham's lap, and she makes sure each one does. I bet Mrs. Referral already likes Graham. Pastor Henry's church feels real comfortable, like a bathtub filled with warm, sunny, sunny water, and no one dresses a fancy. Most of the men are wearing jeans, and hardly any of the ladies are wearing dresses. But Graham and Mrs. Referee are. I'm wearing a skirt because oh, because Graham made me. I used to be a maxi and reach all the way to my toes. But since I had it for three years or more, it directly at my knees. I hate wearing it, but Graham says I'm a young lady now and need to start looking like one. The only good thing about this skirt, this skirt is that it's made of denim, which is as close as a pair of jeans as Graham would let me get. Everybody must know everybody in Pastor Henry's church because everybody's giving hugs to everybody else. All the little kids are running around playing and hiding from each other and the older ones are huddled in a group talking. Billy and I decided to sit with the grown-ups. Mrs. Wilfrill pours Graham a cup of coffee and then Graham lets me drink some just like she does at home. Pastor Henry's church smells delicious because at the same table that has the cof coffee pot, there are seven very big boxes of donuts. There are all kinds, cream-filled, jelly-filled, cinnamon swirls, glazed, sugar-coated, and fried cakes, which are my favorite. And hanging right over... Above that table is a huge picture of Jesus standing all by himself wearing a pair of sandals and a long white thing that looks something like a best rope, but not exactly. He's holding his arms stretched out wide in front of him, so it actually looks like he's guarding the donuts. Maybe Pastor Henry hung the picture there on purpose, so no one takes more than they should, which is pretty smart. I don't think anyone would have the guts to take more donuts than they should if Jesus is watching. I decide to take one fruit cake covered with chocolate frosting and rainbow sprinkles. I hope that's okay with Jesus. Graham and I are meeting everyone in birdsong this morning because Billy says this is what everyone in birdsong does on Sunday mornings. They come to hang with Pastor Henry and have free coffee and donuts. Pretty soon the piano lady begins begins playing and everybody moves into a big part of the church where there are beautiful stained glass windows. One of them is bored up. Billy says someone threw a rock through it, which means Birdsong has at least one bad person. All of a sudden I make Robert Killer holding his fishing pole in one hand and instead of his bit of tackle box in the other, he's creeping he's gripping a rock. I never met anyone who gave me the creeps like he does. Graham and I sat big beside all the referrals except for Pastor Henry. Of course, he gets to sit on the stage so everyone can see him. I wonder if God can see him too. The benches were we are sitting on our on are in rows and they're made of wood, but at least they have red velvet cushions on them. On them, but they they're not very thick, so you actually sink down in the wood. When I sink a pig at Graham, she grins. She's grinning ear to ear, looking more comfortable than ever. I guess I have. Being a big bottom like pedals can come in handy. Once everybody finds a spot to sit, Pastor Henry says a prayer. This morning, Lord, Lord, we want everything to be for you. Let our thoughts, our songs, our church, and our community be all for you. Bless our time together with your holy presence. Amen. Then he asked everyone to stand and turn to page 137, 137 in our 
hymn hymnal, a figure that's the blue book hanging on the back of of the bench in front of me because everybody else is reaching for their blue book too. The piano lady begins a song called It Is Well With My Soul. Everybody joins in, even Graham. I just listen because I've never heard this song on the radio before, and I can't read music any more than I can read Chicken Scratch. Then out of the blue, I start thinking about Graham's physical surface so I cross my fingers and make a wish that she doesn't start to relive right in the middle of church church while everyone's singing about their wellness and their soul. But I must have crossed them too late because by the second verses she stood on her toes. Really Graham? I whisper probably a little too loud for being in church. Then Graham whistles back even louder. Don't you worry, sugar pie. Nobody's gonna notice. So I try to and close my eyes to concentrate on the words while everyone sings them. I try to figure out what they mean. When peace like a river attends my way, when storms like sea blows the road, whether my lot though has taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. Then I'm not exactly sure when it happened, but the song ended. Pastor Henry begins his lecture. This morning, I want to share some key points for the book of Matthew and where Jesus talks to us about worrying. He tells us not to worry about our life. Wow, isn't that challenging? Challenge? He tells us not to worry about the food we'll eat, what we'll drink or the clothes we'll wear. He tells us to consider the birds, to sing about how they, li they live. They don't bother storing food for themselves because they know our Heavenly Father feeds them. God provides them with food and shelter. God creates birds and they take care of them and since we are worse more than birds we can be sure our heavenly father will take care of us jesus also make it makes it clear that we cannot add a single moment to our li lives by worrying so there is no sense in fretting therefore Pastor Henry tells everyone, don't worry, our Heavenly Father knows everything we need. It sounds like Pastor Henry must like birds as much as Billy. And after hearing what Pastor Henry just read, it sounds like God probably likes birds too. He must see his, he goes around feeding them. And about the worrying thing, maybe I didn't need to worry about Billy falling over the edge and into the river because it sounds like no one can make anyone's life longer by, by worrying, not even by a moment. I had no idea going to church could make you think so much. When church is over, Pastor Henry stands at the door and says goodbye to every single person and shakes their hand. He even knows everyone's name. While he's busy saying goodbye, Graham and I help Mrs. Wilfred on Billy clean up. We vac we vacuum Donna Crumbs, wipe coffee spills, push in chairs, and then straighten all the blue song books, which takes quite a while because Billy says they have to be perfectly straight. As soon as pa Pastor Henry brings me and Graham home, we get right to work on our chores. They actually haven't changed much from the ones we did back in Punks 20, except that I don't have to sweep down certain stairs before. That's because now we live in a, a one-story house. And now we have only one bathroom to clean, which most people would be grateful for. But honestly, I'd rather clean two than have to wait all day for Graham to come out of the one we do have. Some days I think she's falling in the accidentally flush herself away. Every now and then I go and check to make sure she hasn't. After our chores are done, Graham and I had to head to the burning place. We start our walking at a pretty good place considering Graham's leg when all of a sudden she lets out a yahoo and she charges down the road. I shouted 
ahead. Graham, what are you doing? She keeps galloping full speed, then yells back over her shoulder. Just doing my exercise, says Sugar Pie. I remember Graham saying her physical sir sir Serapis knows what he's talking about, but I'm being to wonder. I ran ahead and catch up to her when she stops galloping and begins to hop. She hops down the middle of the road the rest of the way, which is just as embarrassing as her galloping. When we finally reach the trail, I look across the street at the Wiffer's house and I hope no one's watching from their front front window. But that's not likely because with Pastor Henry, Mrs. Wiffer's building and all six little Wiffer's there's 18 eyeballs all together. I can only hope the entire family is sitting around the kitchen, the kitchen table, praying with their eyes closed. Once we are in the woods, Graham stops hoping and slows to a snail's place. She's huffing and puffing so hard, I hope she doesn't have a heart attack right before she gets to see the burning place. But since her heart is extra big, I guess it can handle stuff like this. We walk along the wooded trail and then I let Graham step out into the fr field first. She stands still, looks around, then takes a deep breath and she smiles. She looks as happy as she does after she's eaten a dozen chocolate chip cookies dunked in milk. Graham, Neil, Graham keeps smiling and she looks over our at home. All of a sudden, her eyes stop short. Then she points to a bucket at the rope. I wonder if all grown-ups have something against a bucket with a rope tied to it. Graham walks over to it and looks at the riverbank and then back at me. You've been getting water with this? I try to remember the word bilious. The river's na a natural resource, Graham. It's not truly like tap water and the birds and flowers need it to surf. Graham's jaw drops. She's probably impressed with, with how smart I've gotten. That's as well as good sugar pie, but this bag is too blessed deep. I wouldn't want to see anyone fall off the edge, cause if they did, they never see the light of day. Don't worry, Graham. Remember that what Pastor Henry said the morning? We can't make anyone's life longer by worrying. Sugar pie, there's difference between worrying and using your noggin. The end of chapter 11. Chapter 12, Shoot Cakes. The next morning, I overslept and missed the bus, so Graham died, drives me to school. At least, I make it in time to hear the morning announcements and menu spaghetti with meatballs for lunch. I check my schedule and realize I don't have English today. For the first time in my life, I actually wish I did. Later at lunch, Billy spots me in the cafeteria and hurries over. Hey, River, I'm glad I found you. He sits across the table from me. Want to come, want to, come to my house after school? My mom went shopping and bought our ingredients. So now we can make shoot pie, oh, sorry, shoot cakes and hummingbird nectar. Since my mouth is filled with spaghetti, I nod. Then I don't know how he does it, but Billy opens his milk carton with one hand. When I think he's not looking, I try opening mine one-handed. Oh, sorry, I try opening mine one-handed, but end up slipping chocolate milk all over my sp spaghetti myself, the table, and the floor. Two seconds later, the overhead speakers blare. Maintains to the cafeteria. Maintains to the cafeteria. Billy grins and shakes his head. Nice try, but it takes years of practice. 
I shirk off. I shirk to the size of a meatball and want to roll out the door. After school, we hurried to Billy's house. When we got there, it's totally quiet and looks like no one's home. Mrs. Wilfores has everything we need for making shit cakes and hummingbird nectar sitting on the kitchen table. There's also a plate of chocolate chip cookies. In all the quietness, I hear Mrs. Wilfield tiptoe down the stairs. She comes around the corner looking like she's just complete did a marathon while carrying all her little referrals. I just put the last one down for the nap, she says. Even though she looks like she doesn't have an ounce of energy left, she smiles at me and her blue, blue eyes sparkle. It's nice to... It's nice you come, oh sorry, it's nice you could come over a river. She makes me feel warm all over as if she, as if the sun is shining only on me. She places her hand gently on my shoulder and says, you're always rare, Camille. Then she takes a coffee, oh, oh sorry, cookie from the plate and asks his herself. Let me know if you need my help. I'll be on the couch taking a quick nap. I guess it's just me and Billy cooking for the birds. I hope he knows what he's doing because I sure don't. Last year in Pongswani, I flunked home econ ec economics. Graham could believe it. Graham couldn't believe it. Never did. Never could I. Apparently, Mrs. Hall didn't like the way my banana bread turned out. No one told me I had to peel the bananas. So what if it was like chewing an eraser? I still don't think that was gr grounds for failure. But then again, there was also a sewing project I messed up when I had to make a skirt. I didn't think a bit. I said I didn't think it was a big deal that I sewed the wrong size of material together, but absolutely Mrs. Hawk did. I tried explaining that I never wear the stupid skirt anyways, but that only got me an F. Billy arranges our ingredients in alphabetical order, cornmeal, flour, oatmeal, peanut butter, and soot. His way to and oh, sorry, his to his to his way to and so enthusiastic. Let's make shoot cake first. He says, Step number one, we need to me melt the shoot. He turns the stove on and on and hands me a spoon. Here, you can stir first. I move the chalk off hard. What shoot around in the pan. Within minutes, it started melting, transforming into a crystal clear liquid. I wonder if this is how it feels to be a scientist. Then all of a sudden, I realize I have no idea what suit is or where it's come from. But since it looks interesting, I stick my finger in for a taste, taste test, just like Ren would do. But before my finger reaches my lip, Billy stopped me. I wouldn't do that. It's not going to pass. taste good. Oh, I see. Right. I was just checking the temperature. But I think Billy catches on to the fact that I have no idea what shield is. Then he explains so I don't feel so dumb. Isn't it amazing how we can take a chunk of a fat chunk of fat that used to surround the kin kindly of a cow and use it to feed birds. I try staying calm and hope I don't turn green. It's unbelievable, I say, but I'm really thinking it's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. I imagine the insides of cows and visualize huge globs of fat packed around the kind of a cow, which I'm pretty sure has something to do with the whole process of making pee. Billy looks in the pan and seems satisfied. There, he says, one cup of suet completely melted. Now we need one cup of crunchy peanut butter. 
Billy measures it and dumps it in. Okay, he sees, keep stirring. Then he adds two cups of oatmeal, two cups of cornmeal, and one cup of flour. After it makes its mix, Billy steadies the rectangular cake pan on the table, and I dump the massive globe in. We, we press it flat with bare hands. I use two, and Billy one. Ew, I say, Cringy, this feels disgusting. It's crazier than earwaxes. Billy laughs hyster hysterically. I'm not sure about the earwaxes, but the peanut butter sure makes it smell good. The birds are going to love this. Once it's flat, Billy puts it in a fridge to cool and harden. Next, we make the hummingbird nectar. Billy starts by pouring four cups of water into a pan. Once it's boiling, he adds one cup of sugar. I stir until it dissolves. I scoop a little onto a teaspoon and blow on it. Since I'm absolutely sure it's only sugar and wear and water without an ounce of kindly fat, kindly fat, I bring it to my lips and sip. It tastes like liquid cotton candy. What do what to hear something interesting? Billy says. I look at him and wait because I know he's going to tell me either way. A hummingbird's heart beats more than six hundred times a minute, and a human's only beats about seventy-two. Billy's so smart. I wonder if I'll ever be as smart as him. The end of chapter twelve. Chapter 13, Black Little Boot Billy pushes aside the branches as we walk into the woods. It feels cool and fresh after working in the hot kitchen. Hey River, I almost forgot to tell you. My dad said he'll help us make the bluebird houses. That's great if you want an F. You heard Miss, it. You heard Miss Grackle, no parents. But it's for safety reasons, and he'd only cut the wood. There's no way he'd let us use the power cell. I guess you're right. That is great news. As soon as we reach the field, Billy freezes. So I do the same thing. There are tiny birds at the feeder and a bigger, bright red one right in the middle of the bird bath. We crouch, moving low along the ground like two Indian hunters until we reach the lock. We let Oh, sorry, Indian hunters, until we reach the log where we sit without a sound. Neither of us says a word. It's kind of a scared moment. I can't believe there are birds. I never saw they come. Billy whispers. The red one's a northern cardinal. He's a male. Females aren't as colorful. Well, that's not fa fair. Well, that's not fair. Billy laughs and then leans close and whispers again. The other birds at the feeder are black-capped chickadees. When they sing, they sound like they're saying their name. Chickadee-dee, chickadee-dee, chickadee-dee-dee. Billy cracks me up. It must have been his last dee, -dee that made the birds fly away. But Billy says eventually they'll get used to people being around and they'll stay longer. He takes a deep, satisfied breath and looks my way. We better start watering, he says, and I'm filling the bucket first. As Billy positions himself at the edge of the bank, I start getting nervous. You know, Billy, maybe we should listen to your father and get water from your house. He didn't say he, we had to get water from the house. He said he'd rather we did. It's the same thing, and Graham doesn't like the idea of us using the bucket either. Don't worry, River will be careful. As I watch Billy stir the bucket over the edge, I tone my breast and have to force myself from grabbing onto his belt loop. But after a few minutes, I see he's doing fine, and he pulls a full bucket of water up over the edge. I let out my breath and remind myself that I didn't need to worry. I whisper the words from Matthew. We water the seeds and fill the bird bath too. 
Then, just as we are ready to go back and check the shoot, Robert Kilder comes by on his bike. He glares at Billy. Hey, he says, I was here about an hour ago, and there was some ugly birds at your feeder. Billy doesn't look at him. Robert points to the bucket. That's yours? Billy nods. Robert wanders over it. If you guys are getting water from the re where you're crazier than me. I wouldn't stand at the edge if you paid me. Then he steps on the bucket with his black leather boot and press down on its side. He transforms the opening to an oval. Stop it, I shout. What do you think you're doing? Billy touches my arm. It's okay, River. Robbers give me the bucket a kick. If you was smart, you go down river where the bank ain't to step. I want to tell Robert there's no such word as ain't, but I keep my mouth shut. Robert spits, getting back on his bike and rides away. I search Billy's eyes for an answer. I don't want to talk about it, he says. Then he steps on the inside of the bucket and pulls the squid side, trying to fix it. Let's just go back to my house and see if the shit's hard. Billy opens the fridge and pokes the suit with his finger. Yup, it's hard just we, like we want. He puts the pan on the table. I hold it still while he cuts, the, cuts it into six perfectly square pieces, which he says are cakes. He places one of the feeder. Look at that, 8% fit. Snug as a bug in a rug. Billy laughs. What did you say? Song is a bug in a rug. Something Graham says. We save the rest of the cakes in the fridge and then fill the hummingbird feeder. Billy studies it over the sink while I pour the ne nectar. We make a per sorry, we make a pretty good team. We carry the feeders to the burning place, and this time we see even more birds. Billy whispers, we should have brought my camera. We'll remember next time. While we're handling the feeders, Mrs. Habanting comes by carrying a card box. I was hoping you'd be here, she says. Here's a patch of my colonia flux like I promised, and I bought you some day lace too. Those rubby sorted hummingbirds will go crazy over them. We thank Mrs. Bunting and tell her to come back soon. Later then I get home when I get home I find Graham sitting on the couch with a milk jug tied on her ankle doing leg fit, which somehow doesn't seem normal. And I'm pretty sure she reads my mind because she immediately starts explaining herself. Just doing my exercises, she replied. Then she units the jog from her ankle and stands up. Woohoo! Now that's good exercise. As she walks to the kitchen with our milk, I notice she's not waddling as much as she used to. Maybe her physical surface does not know what he's doing. Glad you're home, she replied. She says in a sing-song way. Cut. Cause I've got a pot of stew that's brewing just for you. Graham gets goofy like that sometimes, which never used to bother me when I was little. And it's too bad, really, because I've been thinking about inviting Billy over for lunch. But on account of Graham's peculiar ways and her physical surface harebrained ideas, plus the fact that we don't hold hands and pray before we eat, I decided I better not. I think I nearly die if I brought Billy home and Grandma's was galloping around the house or doing leg lifts with our milk jug. Maybe I will anyways. Billy is so nice he probably wouldn't mind if she was. The end of chapter 13.